Well, good morning. Another beautiful day. Guys, every time I turn the corner down here and come east up the hill and look out across that lowland, how that corn's growing, you know, we're going to see tassels on corn probably in another 10 days. Unbelievable, it seems so early this year. We'll have roasting ears before 4th of July if you've got your sweet corn going. I have told you just about that. So that's good for us people that like that stuff. Hey, this is a special day. Uh, this morning after Sunday school, Violet gave Pastor Lynn a note. Uh, it was 140 years ago, I believe today, that the first service in this church building was held. So happy birthday, Appanoose Baptist, right? Praise God. Now, if John Wilhite were here, because I pick on him all the time about his age, I would ask him to uh, give us a story of that first service. I won't ask you guys any of that. Wonderful. So who has a praise from this week? I'll bet some good things happened in your life. What would you like to praise God about for this week? Got some good rain. Good rain. Amen. Spotty rain. But if you got it, you got it, and it was great. Praise God. How about other things? Good things in your life? Sometimes we get so busy that we kind of forget that, oh, God just made that happen. Jack? I'm sorry? God making earth. God making earth. That's right. And it makes it just as beautiful as it is, doesn't it? Hallelujah. Well, uh, thank you all for our day yesterday, anniversary. My gosh, Carrie posted it on Facebook. Well, what was there? About 70 people that acknowledged. So I thank you for your good wishes for that. We had a wonderful day. Just took it easy. Went to North Topeka in those little shops and everything. Of course, a big part of that for me was a corner cafe with dinner and a piece of pie. So that was very special for us. But thank you for your wishes there. Uh, what about prayer concerns this morning? I know there's several things in the community and in the area uh, people have already made mention of that uh, we certainly want to lift up the Lord this morning. Do you have something on your heart as a prayer concern this morning? Yes. Pat, my mother-in-law, her uh, father passed away. And her last name is? Dyer. Oh, sure. <laughs> her, her, her father is Francis Monner. Monner? Monner, M-O-T-T-E-R. Oh, okay. He was close to 100, and he was ready to go, so Amen. he knew the Lord. Great job. Speaking of death, um, whether you actually uh, associate much in Overbrook or not, a week ago this morning there was a tra tragic accident at the uh, Jeffries Energy Center north of St. Mary's, and Carol Anno uh, lost another son, uh, Craig Rochette. Terrible, terrible situation. Uh, I uh, have known Carol for several years. She worked at Brookside as director of the assisted living for many years, and then she actually served on one of the city boards, the housing commission, uh, with with us for years. And, and her son, Donnie Bryant, was our city maintenance man for a long time. He was killed uh, in a traffic accident last November. And then her second son, Craig, was killed last Sunday. And it just, just broke my heart to think of a mom that had to give up two young men to death in, in eight months time so uh, gosh the visitation the other evening at the funeral home was right at a two hour wait to get through so I know the community really acknowledged that but uh, if you happen to know Carol and Delbert and that family at all why uh, keep them in your prayers because this loss is, is really uh, monumental uh, Chuck told me this morning that the Dean's sister Kathy Yonkers uh, from Hayes is at KU Med with uh, uh, cancer that could be life ending. Uh, they need prayers for that family and God's healing as, as he sees fit to uh, help her through her, her struggle and the rest of her life, however long that might be. So Kathy Yonker, right? Is that right, Chuck? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, Connie, your mom is doing better? Yep. Good. Had a little medical test. Everything went well? Everything was great. Good. Uh, Howard Witham, uh, understand, is doing a lot better? Yes. Karen's 
caregiver and they're staying together in the in the, in the care center in Powell. Care center. So we'll look forward to having them back here, hopefully before too long. Uh, how about other prayer requests? Yes. Um, I've been to see Steve King a couple times. He has out there with us. And we didn't have a part that so much. The first time, he, he was pretty much in his recliner, really can't get around already. And But we visited, I mean, it was good to visit with. And I noticed the next time, I just seemed like I'd already seen a big difference. And his wife. I mean, I can't imagine watching the husband go through that. Yeah. Patty, is it lupus or is it uh, Lou Gehrig's disease? It's ALS. 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 Okay. Okay. I, did, I wasn't sure about that. Yeah. Yes, that's got to be a terrible, terrible situation. Our next door neighbor, uh, the Kaufman family, Jean Kaufman, her brother in law in Scranton. Uh, died uh, oh about a month ago, and he had suffered ALS, and, and that deterioration was you know really hard to, to imagine. So you know, with that, uh, I've been reading uh, Proverbs some this week. You know, the neat thing about the, the book of Proverbs, there's 31 chapters, and it's all those little short statements. Every verse is a message in and of itself. And it's kind of ideal that you can start any time, but if you start the first of the month, in a 31-day month, you read a chapter a day. Amen. And the wisdom that comes out, I'll guarantee you, if you do that for three or four months consistently, it's amazing the wisdom that comes out of those little short verses in Proverbs. And it's all about wisdom. As a matter of fact, this morning one kind of jumped out at me that I wanted to mention to you. It's... Proverbs, the third chapter, and talks about the rewards of wisdom, starting with the fifth verse. And I think this is something that really means a lot as we consider how we accept or interact with the people that we care about, especially as we go for prayer, prayer requests and all. Verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment for your, your bones. Amen. We have got to rely on God's wisdom, even though we have a perception of what we think. Just raise it up to God. Amen. And that's what I think we do very well as we bring our prayers uh, forward and pray for those that, that we care about. Any other prayer requests or comments before we pray? I need to think we need to pray for our nation's leaders. Certainly. Amen. I saw a hand. What about Roy Young? A lot of people know Roy and Jackie Young from Overbrook. Used to live at Quinamo, moved to Overbrook several years ago. Uh, Roy has been found to have a mass in his brain. Now, I don't know that it's cancer. But they think now, after several tests, that something that has been in his head for years, maybe 20 years, but it's so intertwined with his brain that there's no way they can operate. But it does, on occasion, cause him some seizures or that. Yeah. Yeah. So he's on anti-seizure medicine, which prevents him from driving. And if you know Roy at all, that's a problem. So that family needs prayers as, as they go forward there. <coughs> Anything else? I saw a hand over here maybe. No, okay. All right, let's bow and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we start out this morning just thanking you for this church. This building on the top of this hill you planted 140 years ago on purpose. Never to have its doors closed or its lights go out, Lord, that we can be a beacon in this community to so many families and people, both to rejoice and share in who you are and what you mean in our lives, but also to be an attraction to those that may not yet know you. So I just praise you, Father God, for what you implant in our hearts, the desires that we have leaving from here to go out and spread the word that this church 
may continue to do exactly what you intended to do, and I thank you for that. Lord, we lift up people who need prayer this morning. Yes, Lord. Uh, Kathy Yonker and her family, Lord, be with them as they possibly face end-of-life situations here. Give them your peace and your comfort, your understanding. Uh, let the Holy Spirit guide them. Lord, we give you thanks that Connie had a good medical exam is doing well. Thank you, Lord, for the union of Howard and Karen as they come back from Howard's surgery. Uh, that together gives them the strength through you that we believe that healing will take place and we'll look forward to welcoming them back into our uh, congregation soon. Lord, for uh, Francis uh, Motter, uh, his passing, Lord, be with that family, with yes. Jana and her uh, mother-in-law and, and all that will mourn his death, Lord, give them your peace as well. For Stephen King, uh, the ALS is something, Lord, we do not understand at all. Uh, tremendous suffering there, and we just ask that your peace and presence be so large in that family as he possibly nears his end. Lord, for Roy Young, again, good Christian man, we know that he has faith in his heart that will help him, but just give him comfort, he and Jackie and that family, as he deals with this situation. And Lord, for our nation's leaders, we know that you know and we, we just want you to be strong in their lives that they might acknowledge who you are and that your will be done through the decisions and the actions that are made from our presidency all the way down to our local government, Lord, and that your uh, influence be the, the one that they hear and follow. We thank you now, Lord, for this day. Uh, the message that Pastor Lynn will present Lord, the meaning that it will have in our heart, I just ask that we open our hearts to that, that we might take your word home and the wisdom thereof so that it will be big in our life this week. Be with us now in this service. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. second coming we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope we believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring to Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the house to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Now about time and space, we do not need to rise. You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, Jesus is destruction will come on this assignment. But you are not in darkness. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night and to the darkness. Let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Amen. Amen. If you would stand, please, and turn in your hymnal to Hymn 262, we'll sing all three verses.
seated. We'll turn to 271. Jesus shall reign. Say verse 1 and 4. Right into the next song. And then right into the next song. Crown him with many prayers. the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why are your faces so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told, told Joseph his dream. He said to him, in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was forcibly carried off to the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread, and the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. 
The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat away your flesh. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all of his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had said to him in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph who forgot him. Thank you, Patty. May God add his blessing to the reading of his most precious of holy word. And uh, this morning I'm going to speak to you uh, again about adversity. And probably the one person of all the great saints of the Old Testament who had more adversity than anyone else was Joseph. And we want to talk about Joseph this morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, how we praise you and thank you for your word. For your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And your word speaks to our hearts. Your word is an encouragement to us. It tells us how to live. It tells us how to be successful. But it also tells us how to handle adversity. When trouble and problems come into our lives, Lord, we can seek direction and guidance from you through your word. And how we praise you and thank you that you have preserved your word and handed it down to us to this very hour. Oh Lord, how grateful we are that we have your word today to lean upon, to find guidance and direction. And in times of trouble, Lord, we can look to you and know that the suffering and trials that we're going through, you will help us through that difficult time because you promised to never leave us or forsake us. So Lord, guide us through the service today. We thank you for every person who's present here today and I pray that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher and our guide as we walk through the pages of your word this morning. For it's in Jesus' name that I ask this all. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a song. And uh, after the singing of this song, the children will go to children's church. But this is a great song. And it's a song that uh, I think is very important for our church. Because I think there is a sweet, sweet spirit here. Turn to number 300. how you have uh, so liberally given to the cause of Christ here at Athens. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, I, I've served, uh, before I came to Athens the second time, by the way, I, I had served three other churches between uh, 
Peabody, Kansas, Columbus, Kansas, and then Scott City, Kansas, uh, all totaling about 40 years of ministry in those three churches. Between those three churches, I pastored as a student minister, I pastored right here, 50 some years ago. Then in retirement, I come back to the same church. God is so good. God has such a, quite a, quite a sense of humor, doesn't he? <laughs> that God would bring me back here where I started. And you know, I didn't know much back in those days. I'll have to admit, uh, I was learning. But I learned a lot through uh, a lot of trials and difficulties. But God taught me some wonderful things that helped me in ministry. And you know, one of the things that thrills me, uh, you know, when I was at Peabody, we had a tremendous revival where we added to that church, uh, there was about 35 people coming when we went there, and eight years later there was 175 coming on Sunday mornings. Then when I went to Columbus, we built a brand new sanctuary, and uh, the people told me, you know, we'll never ever see this paid for. We were, we were making payments on that church of $700 a week, not a month, but a week. Two years later, we burned the mortgage. And, uh, and then I went, to, I went to Scott City, and we just built almost a million dollar addition to the church, an education unit. And again, they told me, you know, we still owe almost 400000 on this building. We'll never get it paid for. Again, two years later, we burned the mortgage on that building. Those were, I mean, it was just tremendous. But you know what? When I came here, we had just a half a dozen people coming. Now look, almost every Sunday we have 50 people coming on Sunday morning. But you know, I guess the, the thing, the reason I tell you this is because I see, to me, this is even more encouraging to me than the other three churches because of how small our congregation was 12 years ago. And to see it growing and to see how financially God has blessed us through the sacrificial giving of his people. That just thrills me to death. And, uh, and it's not Lynn Smith, it's God, okay? It's what God is doing here. That happens to you. And after 140 years, we're still going. And let me tell you, we're going to keep going. Because God is here. And God is blessing us. I'm going to ask Jeff, even I want to ask Scott, Vic, if you guys will come to take the offering this morning. Let's bow together in prayer. Father in heaven, I just rejoice at all the wonderful blessings that you poured out upon us. You've opened the windows of heaven and poured out a blessing upon here, us here at Aquinas. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you and to give back to you through our gifts. Take these gifts and use them to spread the good news of Jesus. And we'll ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.
I talked to you about why bad things happen to good people. And I uh, shared a little bit about my own experience. And, uh, you know, as I shared in Sunday school, after last Sunday, things didn't get any better. Uh, I was in such pain on Monday that I had to go to the emergency room in Topeka uh, where the doctors informed me I had to get some help. And so on Thursday, I ended up at KU Med Center where I met with my pain management doctor who gave me great encouragement, of which I praise and thank God. And what I say to you today is that in the midst of our adversity and in the midst of our pain, we can always see God, God at work. God is doing good things. Last week we talked about how suffering causes people to ask questions. Why is this happening to me? Why am I going through what I'm going through? Why? Why now? What are you trying to teach me now, Lord? And questions about suffering and trials and adversity are questions that are hard to answer. You remember last week we talked about the blind man and uh, the, the disciples asked Jesus, you know, why did this happen to this blind man? Was it because of some sin in his life? Was it, some, was it, was it because of his parents? Was, it, was his parents disobedient to God? What happened to, that this would happen? Why did he turn blind? And uh, Jesus told him that it happened so that he could be glorified. So that God would be glorified through his son Jesus. And the blind man was healed, wasn't he? And great things happened as a result. And then we learned about suffering provides opportunities. Uh, opportunities for the one who's suffering. You know, I can't tell you how often I have led people to Christ in a hospital room. And you know why, how this happens? People are in the hospital, they're suffering. They're worried, they're fearful. And so here's how I witness to them. And I've done this, I can't tell you how many times. I would leave them this little booklet, Steps to Peace with God, put out by Billy Graham. And I would say to them, you know, I'm going to leave this little booklet with you. And in a day or two, I'm going to be back and ask you what you thought of this little booklet. And after reading that little booklet, they would say, you know, I prayed that prayer in this book. And I said, well, did Jesus come into your heart? Yes, he did. Why did he come in? Because I asked him to come in. And you see, it's a wonderful thing. It provides great opportunities for people to find God in the midst of their suffering. And it, it gives us opportunities to live for God. You know, it does something for our character when we come into, when we suffer, when we have adversity. <laughs> I can tell you, John Dillon and I were at KU together last uh, Thursday. And uh, we both found out that the doctor was going to be two hours late. He ended up being three hours late. And, uh, you know, I can just tell you that that wears on your patience. Right, John? <laughs> it wears on your patience. But, you know, it's good for our character. It helps us to grow in our relationship with the Lord. And suffering and adversity provides benefits. Helps us to find out what's really important in life. Suffering builds our character. Helps us to be a better person. Helps us to be more humble. Helps us to be more patient. Suffering helps us to have more compassion toward other people. I can tell you that's the one thing that I have learned through the trials and suffering I've gone through over the years with my health is that it helped me to be more compassionate toward other people who are going through the same thing. And then suffering drives us to God. You know, I want to just share this with you this morning. 
And in your uh, bulletin, you have the outline for my sermon. And I can guarantee you, we're not going to get through this sermon today. We'll finish it next week, and that's okay. Because I hope it will drive you to come back and get the rest of the story. But let me tell you, Thomas Edison, he might have been one of the most, and maybe the greatest inventor of all time. But you know what? I can't tell you, in, in reading about Thomas Edison and his history, he had so many failures, hundreds of failures, before his first invention was successful. But you know what? Thomas Edison didn't give up. He kept going, he kept trying. And he had a lot of setbacks, a lot of discouragement. And oftentimes we look at the hardships, we look at the trials, we look at the difficulties that come our way, and we look at them as something that is hard to deal with. And yet, I can tell you, it is helpful in our overall journey with the Lord. And when we look at the Thomas Edison approach, we see the adverse moments of our lives are more than annoyances, but are actually opportunities to learn and to grow in our experience with the Lord. You know, I read a book one time, and uh, uh, it's been several years ago I read this book, but I remember uh, in he wrote this book in 1987. I think I read, probably wrote it, or read it just shortly after that. But it was a book that was written by Gary Richman. And the name of the book was A View from the Zoo. It was it's kind of an interesting book because he, he used the stories about animals to help us to see how to deal with adversity in our lives. And I want to just share with you what he said about the birth of a giraffe. And I think it really gives us insight uh, to our trials and our hardships that come into our lives. When the little giraffe calf is born, he falls, you know how tall the mother is. The little baby falls 10 feet on its back to the ground. Then the mother momentarily hovers over the, the little newborn before kicking the baby head over heels. If the calf doesn't get up, he gets another good kick. This process is repeated, stimulating the efforts of the baby. Finally, when the little giraffe gets up on its wobbly legs, the mother kicks him off his feet again. And to an outsider, each behavior seems cruel and unnecessary. But to the mother, it is an expression of love. The first lesson in life helps the newborn to quickly develop the skills needed to move rapidly when the herd uh, uh, sees that predators are near. And sometimes, Gary Richmond says, sometimes we feel as though God has no sooner got us on our feet when he turns around and knocks us down again. The next time that that happens, think about the newborn giraffe. God simply may be strengthening you for your own protection in the future. I think there's a tremendous lesson for us here in this story about the giraffe. And we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph. And Joseph faced a lot of adversity. As I said earlier, he probably faced more adversity than any of the saints of the Old Testament. You remember he grew up as a young man. Uh, probably he was the first son of Jacob and Rachel. Now, Jacob had other sons from other wives. But from Rachel came Joseph the first. And as a result, Joseph was the favorite. And you remember he made him a coat of many colors. And while the other boys were out in the field, guess where Joseph was? 
He was in the house with his dad and with his mom. Let's face it, he was kind of spoiled. But God had to toughen him up for him to become the man that God wanted him to be. You remember that Jacob was a dreamer. And we don't have time to read this. But if you go home, read the 37th chapter and the verse, uh, first 11 chapters, or first 11 verses of chapter 37 of Genesis. And it gives the story of, of Joseph and how he was a dreamer. And he dreamed that someday he would be a ruler. And that really came true because eventually he became prime minister of Egypt. A Hebrew. Un unbelievable that he would become the prime minister as a Jew in the land of Egypt. But God brought him to that point. But before he got to that point, a lot of other things happened to him. Do you remember that Joseph went out to look for his brothers? His father sent him out and said, you go look and see how they're doing. And so he went out to look for them, and he didn't find them where they were supposed to be, so he went to another place, and he eventually found them. And boy, this upset his brothers. And they threw him in a pit. And they were planning on killing him. But then some slave traders came along, headed to Egypt. And so they sold him to these slave traders. And he ends up in Egypt. Now, God was directing his life. And here's what happened. When he got to Egypt, they appointed him as one of the advisors or administrators in the household of Potiphar. Now Potiphar was the captain of all of Pharaoh's uh, army and all of his that was going on with Pharaoh, Potiphar was the captain. He was a leader. And Joseph was made head over his household. Now when Patty read for us from chapter 40, you know how old Joseph was, chapter 40? He was 27 years old. So he was just a young man, very young. And Potiphar's wife came to him and said, come and go to bed with me. And Joseph knew that this was wrong. And he wouldn't yield to the temptation. And so it upset Potiphar's wife. And so she reported to her husband, and said, you know what? That Hebrew that was appointed head over our household, he raped me. And this was not true. But she grabbed a hold of Joseph's cape. And so she had that and she said, see, I have part of his clothing here. And guess what? They threw, when Potiphar found this out, he threw Joseph in prison. Now while he was in prison, there were two other people that came into prison. The chief butler and the baker. Now what were the duties of the, of the butler? The chief butler was the fellow who did all the tasting of the food that went before Pharaoh's table. <coughs> And if the food that he partake of, if it was poison in it, the chief butler would die. But if it was no poison in it, then it was good for Pharaoh to eat. And then the chief baker, he picked all the food. He was the chef. He took care of everything. Well, guess what? I don't know what happened. The Bible doesn't really tell us. But somehow... They got into trouble with Pharaoh. And they ended up, both of them, in prison. Now, I don't think that there was poison in the food, but there was something that they did that was wrong. And it upset Pharaoh. And so he had them put into prison. Now, while they were in prison, they had a dream. 
Both of them had a dream. The chief butler had a dream, and the baker had a dream. And Joseph said to the butler, he said, I think I can tell you what the meaning of your dream is. And in the 40th chapter and verse 9, the Bible says that in this dream there were three branches of a tree. And these branches produced grapes. And in the dream, the chief butler pressed the grapes into Pharaoh's cup and served wine to Pharaoh. And so Joseph explained to the butler that what this meant was in three days, he was going to be restored back as the chief butler or Pharaoh. Well, boy, that sounded like good news to the baker. He's thinking, what? The butler got good news. I'm sure he did good news. But the Bible tells us in verse 16, after hearing the interpretation of the butler's dream, the baker couldn't wait to hear what was going to happen to him. But Joseph did not have good news. In verse 16, it tells us that this man, this baker's dream, he saw white baskets on his head. And in the baskets were baked goods. And the birds of the air came and snatched the bread and the baked goods away. And Joseph explained to him that the three baskets were three days. And at the end of the three days, the baker would be hanged by Pharaoh. And the birds would come and eat away his flesh. Now the Bible says at the end of this chapter that three days later was Pharaoh's birthday. And he had a royal party for his servants. And the dreams were foretold. And the Bible says that he hired back the chief butler just exactly like Joseph said. And the Bible says that he also went and hanged the baker. Now, the main purpose of the story is not to give this background information, except to say that the pur purpose of this is to remind us that the butler left to go back to his throne. And Joseph said to him, Would you remember me to favor when you get back to your job. Because I have been put in this place and I've done nothing wrong. But guess what? The Bible says in the very last verse of the 40th chapter that when he got based back to his place of responsibility, the butler forgot all about Joseph. And I don't know whether he did that intentionally. He probably did. He probably did it because he was afraid that he might lose his position again, thinking that he was favoring Joseph. So he never mentioned it. And Joseph had to end up serving two more years in prison. Now here's the good news. You would think after hearing and, and thinking that maybe this chief butler would, would talk to Pharaoh and help him have a shorter period of time in prison. And he kept waiting to get that news, but it never came. But the Bible tells us that Joseph never got angry. He waited patiently in prison to the day that he was finally released. Now, Joseph is a wonderful picture of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the Bible. Probably the greatest symbol of who Jesus Christ is, is is found in the Old Testament in Joseph. Because we never hear Joseph ever complain. The Bible never says anything about anything that he ever did that was wrong. The only thing was this where he said, I feel like I've been put in prison 
because of something I did not do. I'm innocent. And yet, I'm suffering here in prison. You know, uh, as we think about Joseph and how he walked through this situation, God had a purpose for Joseph. And I, I want to tell you, there's not a one of you here in this sanctuary this morning that hasn't been through some kind of adversity, some kind of a trial, some kind of suffering. And I want you to know there's a God out there who cares for you and loves you. And that He has a plan and a purpose for your life. Just as He had a plan and purpose for Joseph. In the midst of the difficulties, in the midst of the trials, God wants to teach us. And God wants us to learn. And God wants to know, to let us know that He's there for us. That He will never leave us or forsake us. I want to show you from this passage a scripture from this story. I want to share some principles that will help you face adversity and trial in your life. And if you have your bulletin handy, the first point that I want to make is problems and adversity provides greater opportunities. And this is found in Genesis chapter 40 and verse 23. You know, uh, in 1993, Charles Colson, and many of you know who he is, you know, he was the hatchet man in the Watergate investigation. And for his role in the Watergate thing, he was put into prison. And he served in prison for seven months. And, but in 1993, he received a special prize, a $1 million gift, because he won the Templeton Prize. Now that's a, that's a prize that we don't think about. You know, we hear about the Pulitzer Prize, we hear about the Nobel Prize, but we don't hear about the Templeton Prize, but it's a greater, it, there's a greater gift there than there is in the other two. It's the largest prize for achievement in any field. It's kept higher than the Nobel and other fields in science and literature. And he received this prize because of the way he handled his adversity. He served seven months in prison as a hatchet man. But it was there in prison that he found the Lord. And he was converted to Jesus Christ. And it led to the founding of prison fellowship. Now I can tell you in Kansas, in our, in our prison system, where prison fellowship is allowed to come in, and almost all of our prisons now, in Kansas have prison fellowship present and it's the greatest rehabilitation tool that's ever been known for those who are in prison it changes their lives those that are willing to go through the program and when they get out of prison they're ready to get out of society and never go back to prison again in response to receiving this award this is what Charles Colson said out of tragedy and adversity come great blessings. I shudder to think of what I would have been had I not gone to prison. Adversity can be God's refining fire. And it was in my life. Think about it. What a tremendous attitude. But it changed his life forever. And you see, sometimes when we go through adversity and we say, Lord, why are you doing this to me? Why am I having to go through this? And God says, I want to provide greater opportunities for you as a result of what you're going through. You see, God wants to bless us. He does not want to ruin our lives. He wants to be a blessing to us. You know, 
I, I think about the Apostle Paul. He wrote many letters to churches, and they're all found in the Bible. And some of them are called prison epistles. And the reason they're called prison epistles is because he wrote them while he was in prison. Think of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the greatest book of encouragement for the Christian that's ever been written. Because we have this great hope that Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's going to take us out of this old world and we're going to be with him forever and we're going to reign and rule with him forever. Isn't that wonderful? That's good news. Found in the book of Revelation. But guess where it was written? John, the apostle, wrote the book of Revelation while he was exiled on the island of Patmos. Put there because of his faith. One of the greatest books ever written, probably other than the Bible, is Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know if you ever read it or not, but it's a great book. Written by a man by the name of uh, John Bunyan. Great book. But he was in prison for his faith when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. You see, Joseph was about to learn in his prison experience that he had not been forgotten by God. That God was with him and God was going to be with him forever. And the Bible tells us that through all the experiences that he went through, God had to toughen him up. Because as I said, he was a spoiled brat. So to speak. But God toughened him up so that he could become the prime minister of Egypt. And in the end, when there came a great famine in Israel, guess who was the prime minister who was giving out food to the Israelites? It was none other than Joseph. And who were those ones who came for food? His brothers, who had sold him into slavery. But God used Joseph to minister to his brothers. And Joseph said to his brothers, what you did to me, you meant to actually ruin my life. But God has used it for my good. Boy, isn't that powerful? Listen, I want you to know, friends, that all of us go through trials and tribulations and struggles. But thank God we have his son Jesus who surrounds us with his love and his promise to us and I want you to know that God has never gone back on any promise he ever made and his promise is I'll be with you always even to the very end of the age let's pray Father in heaven thank you for your word thank you for giving us your encouragement through your word but in the, even in the midst of our adversity, you are there. You are there helping us to learn. To help us to be your children. To be people who use the opportunities that you give us through suffering to help others. To help us be more compassionate. Oh God, how we thank you. That even in the adversity of this life, you are in the midst of it. You're there to help us in every situation. Oh, God, we praise you and thank you today. And we ask this all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, our song of closing is God Will Take Care of You. And boy, is that powerful. And we're going to sing the first and second verses of 107. And... Uh, this is great. Let's stand together.
promise. Amen. That is so true. And in the midst of our adversity, in the midst of our trials and suffering, in the midst of our pain, it's good to know that God will take care of Oh man, I love that. We need to leave here with that thought today. And we need to leave here with that little chorus of that hymn that I love so much. And I told my wife, I want this at my funeral. Oh, how I love Jesus. Let's sing it, and then at the end, I'll give the benediction. Right? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first loved me. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here today. I want you to know I love you all. And you're such a blessing to me because, you know what? I know you're praying for me. And that's the only way we as Christians can get through the day is when we know our brothers and sisters in Christ are praying for us and encouraging us. God bless all of you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the special day you've given us. This day when we honor you and we honor your son Jesus Christ because it was on this day, on the first day of the week that he arose from the grave, victorious over sin and death. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful promise that you'll never leave us or forsake us. And now may the grace and the mercy and the peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest and abide and go with each one of you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.